Hello, and welcome to episode seven of the Black Sheep Knitter podcast. My name is Sarah, and I am coming to you from a wintry mix, but sunny here in Madison, Wisconsin. On this podcast, we talk about all things fiber, knitting, crocheting, quilting, sewing, spinning, although I haven't talked about spinning yet, but that's coming. Um, so if that sounds like your cup of tea, please feel free to subscribe. Um, also, that's your best bet because I'm pretty random with my uploads. <laughs> so it might be a while, but I think we're good. So just to address the elephant in the room for those of you who are returning, um, returning subscribers, where have I been? Well, I have been here, but it did not look like this for a very long time. And honestly, buying a house, kind of a lot. <laughs> It's kind of a lot. So I really thought I was just going to buy a house before I even moved in, get every, like all the major renovations done and like in two months, like, right? Like, so delusion is, is lives over here. Okay. Delusion. So anyway, I bought my house at the end of, well, I bought it in June. I moved in at the very end of August and then I thought, okay, well, you know, I didn't get everything done, but like a month. That feels, that feels doable. Now, for those of you who have had to renovate your house, you know that trying to get everything done in two months in the summertime is a fool's errand because everybody's already booked, okay? There's nobody to hire. Now, I did get very lucky. I found the greatest contractor of my life, and he was able to do the majority of my bathroom remodel. He's also since been back to do my sunroom remodel. He will be back to do the kitchen remodel. So hooray for Mike. Mike is the real MVP of this house, which we have lovingly named Chateau Gateau <laughs> because I am the queen of desserts. But anyway, um... All that to say, it was not finished when I moved in, and it is still not finished. There is no decor on the walls in this room, um, but all of the furniture is in finally. So I've gotten the right pieces. Um, I've been able to organize things. I've been really focusing on like the organization side of things just to make sure that I have what I want, where I want it, and then we'll worry about like designing. But it's been a lot. It has been a journey. And so I apologize for being gone for six months. Um, that was not my intention. But once I actually got things kind of settled in this room, there was like another problem. And you're probably like, oh, now what? I didn't have any light. So the house is generally a very bright space, but only on the back of the house. And the craft room where we are today is on the front of the house. <laughs> so I hope this lighting is good because it's all it's all I got. Um, I don't have enough floor space or table space to add more lights. So I've been very stressed because I'm like, I can't film anything because there's no lighting. And then today I was just like, I'm just going to film because otherwise it'll be like a year and I miss you all. So I am back. Anyway, enough of all that. So I'm going to be rusty. Y'all y'all already know I'm really chatty. So um, a lot of times people are like, grab something cozy to drink and like a little snack. Um, y'all are going to need like a 12 course meal. Okay. Um, I would get multiple beverages. So beverage goblin it up because <laughs> I haven't filmed since September. Now I'm not going to try to get through everything I've purchased in September because I just can't. Um, I, I will spread it out. Also, we'll talk about this more later about my plans for 2024, but like, I'm just going to be consuming a lot less or I'm going to try. I'm going to try because what I learned about putting this room together and generally putting this house together is I have too many things. I have too many things. They're all things that bring me joy and they're all things that I want, but like, could I use them though? You know? Uh, like, do I need more yarn? No. So we are going to try to use what I've got and try to supplement with skeins to get the things that I want to make. But I'm also probably going to try to like make less. And we'll also talk about that later. So anyway, um, I do, before we talk about this, okay, um, I also wanted to mention 
that I'm going to try to film more regularly. So I was doing once a month. I would like to get back to doing once a month with the occasional surprise episode mid-month. I'm saying surprise episode because honestly, the way the light is set up here, I mean, listen, the fact that I, like, I got up this morning, saw the light, and I was, like, to the shower now. <laughs> like, I ran to get ready because I was, like, I don't know how much light I got, but I got to film. I got to film. So, anyway, so look look forward to some more frequent episodes, at least once a month, maybe twice a month. We will see. I'm going to try to get back on my cadence because I really do love this whole community, and I have been MIA for too long. All right. Now, this... Now y'all can already see that this is fitting like a, well, not like a glove, because that would mean it would be skin tight. It's not, it's it's very, it's very cozy. Um, I did a fun little detail that we'll talk about, but what am I wearing? What am I wearing, folks? This is the Ranunculus by Midori Hirose. Now, I did, hosted a locale from September 1st to December 31st, called the Miss the Boat Cal 2023, some version of that. Bit of business before I tell you about the details of this glorious yarn, because my God, I... Um, turns out Instagram changed their algorithm. I did remember too late that somebody mentioned when I first kicked off the Cal, oh, they're not allowing you to see all things tagged anymore. So like, you're gonna have to find like an alternate. And I was like, what? Now, having never run an Instagram cal, I didn't really know what that meant. What it means is that I can't see everybody that entered. It only shows me like a selection of people using the hashtag. So I'm very, very sorry. Um, but I reached out to a couple of folks who also run cals and do them on Instagram. And a lot of them were like, well, I do Instagram and I do Ravelry and email. And I was like, oh, it's too late for all that though. Um, so what I have come up with, thanks to Mandy from um, Mandy. Oh my God, my brain. Mouses makes. How can you tell I've been gone forever as I can't use my brain? Anyway, she gave me the brilliant idea of have people tag you in their ranunculus posts. So I am very sorry. It's annoying to have to go back and like add a thing. But if you can tag my name, I can then see all of their posts that have me tagged in them. So that is how I will pick the winner. Um, if you aren't using Instagram, um, you can email me at the black sheep knitter at gmail.com and I will collect all of the things and then I will select some winners and I'll show you the prizes again after I tell you about these details. Now, why am I wearing a ranunculus? Because everybody's got one, right? That was the whole point of the cowl is that I felt very, like the FOMO was real, but also I didn't love the styling on the pattern. So I was also just like, why is everybody making this pattern? Like, why? <laughs> so I decided to challenge myself last year by making a pattern that I kind of thought wasn't very cute. Just to understand like what the appeal was because like tens of thousands of people have made this pattern. Now, post ranunculus, specifically with this yarn combination, I get it. Kind of like the beige shirt. kind of like the petite knit, okay? Uh, I was wrong. It's a fabulous pattern. It's very confusing though, honestly, with some of the like details. Like I was like trying to watch the video and like read, I was like, what? I don't know if what I did worked. I've seen some people's, so if I get a little bit closer, like some people's, this looks more like a cable than mine does, but honestly, I'm not mad at it. I love the textures and the yoke fits perfectly. Y'all know I struggle with the yoke, okay? So, it's a dream. It's very soft. It's It fits beautifully. It's a color I wouldn't normally pick, but when I was in Montreal, not this past winter, but the winter before, um, I went to a Spas Tricot and I was like, can I try this sample? Because it was a sample ranunculus and it was in the size one. And I was like, this actually fits me and it fits me well. And I really like this color, which at that point I think was like kind of a coppery, copper is not the right word, kind of like a golden wheat. I don't wear that color either. Like I like mustard and I like yellow, but golden kind of metallic-y wheat, not really my vibe. But 
it looked so good on me that I was like, I just want to make it in this exact this yarn and they were like we don't make those colors anymore and I was like no <sighs> but they did have these so let me tell you what I'm wearing so this is a combination of the Julia Salon what is Fino in the color Sherwood I used about one and a half skeins and it's held with the Espace Tricot Bone Tricot Bliss Mohair in the color dark olive okay I mean I just like do you see this halo like look how it's now one of the things for me that is tricky about mohair I have been a mohair naysayer as y'all know um it's kind of scratchy I find in general mohair to be hard for my skin to wear I have my couple of pieces that I've made that I wear anyway and I just sort of like deal with how itchy they get but this it's like perfection it's perfection it's soft it's not itchy it's not too hot because I feel like it's like an open enough weave because you're knitting it on such giant needles like it's just really great the only thing that I don't like about it is that it's the mohair part that all sweaters with mohair have which is it's always in my face like it's in my mouth it's in my like eyelashes <laughs> it gets stuck to all my clothes so I need to like walk around with like a lint roller when I wear it but it's very pretty lint so we're good now I did want to show you a modification because I showed this on Instagram and people were like oh I love the modification so instead of doing the recommended cuff um, from the pattern I really wanted to do a two by two rib so I did but I also felt like it would be fun to instead of just having like a completely like plain arm to do just a little bit of detailing from the yoke so I took this section and I just popped it right there Boop. and I really love it I really love it see it's already I've worn this maybe four times and it's like but you know what? I don't care. I don't care. I also don't think I've, I might not have blocked this yet. I'm actually just realizing I, I probably just was so excited to put it on that I didn't even block it. So we'll block it and maybe that'll help with the, with the shedding. But anyway, the ranunculus, Midori Hirose, it's a winner. It's a keeper. I want to make another one of these in black and imagine my sadness, my disappointment, my grief to find that these two yarns, the Fino and the Bliss Mohair, do not come in black. I, why? <laughs> now, I did have the, um, so Julie Esselin, I, I don't know if it's, if it's like the actual person or the brand, whatever, reached out on Instagram because I was like, I need to make this in black. And they were like, we do have black in some of our other, other lines. And I was like, oh! and so I got super excited because I didn't, I didn't catch the other lines part. So I immediately was like, especially go, blah, blah, blah. like, and then I was like, where, where is it? Where? where? It's not in the feet now. It's not, it doesn't, they don't make it in the Fino. They make it in like other, other weights. And I'm like, but I need, I need this. C can y'all imagine this in black on me with my wardrobe? I would be so obnoxious out in public. I would be, I would be so obnoxious. I would, you would not, anyway, it's not to be, it's not to be had, unfortunately. So if, anyone watching has suggestions for yarn substitutes for the Fino and the Bliss Mohair, specifically the Mohair, because it really like this combo. Oh, also I should mention that the Fino is, I think it's a Merino cashmere silk blend, which is why there's like a slight luster to the fabric as well. It's just, I want to make everything out of it. In fact, I was so desperate to just have the combo. I almost got a cream base and like this lichen mohair and was like, I that'll work, right? 
probably on somebody else. I don't know about, <laughs> I'm glad I didn't pull the trigger because I, I was like, I, I just need more of these two yarns together to make something, some sweater. I don't care what it is. And then I was like, hold up. Am I going to make like a white, like a cream sweater? And I knew that, that was a bridge too far. The beige is like as far as I, I felt like I could go. Okay. And even that was like almost not really beige. Cream, I'm not there. I am not there yet. So I, 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 I pulled my finger back from, the, from the, the purchase button and was like, let me sit with this for a little bit. I want it in black. This boss Trico, if you're listening, please, for all, for all that is holy, black. <laughs> I need it in black. Or I'll even take the, the like darkest charcoal or the darkest navy. You know what? I got to go back and look because maybe they were just sold out and I wasn't seeing something. Because I'm like, how is there not some type of like super dark neutral for moi? Anyway, all right. What else have I finished? Well, <laughs> let me tell you. Um, I, when I was in Boston and New York for uh, Wool and Folk and Sheep and Wool, and New York Sheep and Wool, so Rhinebeck, um, which I'll talk about in a little bit, I took a project because I wanted to have something that was relatively easy to work on. I'd seen it on Instagram. I loved it immediately and like begged the designer to let me test knit it because I needed it that quickly. <laughs> now y'all know my history with test knitting has been garbage okay <laughs> it's been terrible and I swore I was never gonna test it anything else ever again and then I saw this shawl and I thought but it's a shawl though surely that will make a difference and you know what it did it did so I present to you okay iPad just stop don't clock out I need you to actually like be a thing one moment I already remember what it is I just got to get the color right so do y'all see this Ah, it's so good. It's so, ooh, it's so, so good. Oh my God. So this is the Calamity Shawl by Corinne Purefoy of I Knit You Not on Instagram, okay? Now I knit it, in case you can't tell, it smell, even smells good. I just, why is this yarn the greatest yarn ever? This is Malabrigo Rios. It's my favorite worsted of all time. It just is. I've not found a worsted yarn I love more than this. I don't know if it exists. I, I don't think it does. I Everything I've ever made out of the Rios, even the failed test knit from last year or whenever that was, which was still Rios, still amazing, just didn't fit. Look at this, the depth of color. When I saw her pattern, I saw it in cream and I thought, again, not a cream girly, but I was like, let me see what I can find. So I went to my store and I was like, colors, they didn't really have a whole lot, but I happened to be there just long enough hemming and hawing over color choices for their shipment of Rios to come in. The squeal that I squealed, the squeal, okay. I probably was calling dolphins, dogs, I don't know. But when the box opened and I saw a giant packet of Matisse Blue, I was like, I will take five of those, thank you. <laughs> and that was that. So I knit this pretty quickly. Um, I knit it on the plane. I knit it while I was in Boston. I knit it while I was at Rhinebeck. Well, not really, because we weren't at Rhinebeck for very long. I'll get to that. Um, but it was such a fun knit. Like, look at these textures. So this is my first pattern by Corinne. It will not be my last. It will not be my last. It's just gorgeous. It was so relaxing to knit. It was so easy to follow. I loved the structure of the pattern. Um, like she has these like little sections where you like check things off as you're going. So it's sort of a built in row counter. It's just, it was very, 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 very satisfying to make this. Okay. And the color and the yarn just made it even better. But I, I mean, like it's, it, and it's gigantic, which. <sighs> so anyway, 
highly recommend if you need a simple but satisfying knit, you want something that you can wrap around yourself like a blanket, and you want to support a wonderful designer who just seems like a lovely person. I've met her a few times now um, at the yarn shop in Milwaukee. Calamity Shawl. 100% recommend it. We'll be making more. Also probably, well, maybe not in black. This one feels like the, the textures are subtle enough that they might get lost in a, in a black yarn. But we'll see because I do have some black, I have black Rios. So <laughs> y'all know how I get. Now, I do want to talk about, so those were two success, success. Let's talk about a fail. Okay, let's talk about a fail. It's another FO. I finished it before Rhinebeck. For those of you who are returning, you might think, oh God, is it the coat? Is it the coat? It's the coat. Now, while the knitting of the coat was enjoyable, albeit a bit stressful towards the end because I did not decide on some techniques soon enough. So I was trying a lot of things for like a couple of months thinking I got plenty of time. By the time I picked a technique, I didn't have plenty of time and I was stressed and I was, it was not good. It was not pretty towards the end. And I made some choices that I regret and they made the garment basically unwearable. It's gigantic. So what am I talking about? I am talking about the moonflower coat. Now, I don't know exactly how I'm going to show. I don't know how I'm going to show it to you because there's not enough space for me to stand up and show the whole thing. But what I will do I didn't even, I didn't even sew in the ends. I'm realizing I was so disgusted with like how this turned out, but let me try and at least give you a little something. This is going to be so awkward. It's so big. Okay, here we go. <laughs> I hope that the, I, I can't, I, it's so big. I can't even see what's happening. I don't even know what's going on. Okay, here's a sleeve. There, there's a sleeve. Okay. So like the knitting, I mean, I don't want to toot my own horn, but toot toot. Okay. It was, I, I did, I did the damn thing. Okay. Like, look at, I mean, the problem is that when I started it, let me take you back almost a year. <laughs> not, not really. Let me stop being dramatic. But I knew I wanted to make this coat for Rhinebeck because I was going to go last year. It was going to be my first time and I wanted to be wearing something very impressive that was like a lot of knitting because, you know. Um, and what happened is that it was knit in pieces, which I don't mind, but it's color work. And I have never done, which I didn't realize, I had never done color work flat. So I was like doing it and thinking, my tension's kind of wonky. Like, is that, why is this so weird? And then I sat and I thought, and I was like, oh, I've only really ever done fair aisle. And I'm fairly certain I've only done it in the round. So it sort of sorts itself with the way that I knit. Like it keeps the tension very even. This, as you might be able to see from these sections, have very long areas where there's no, like you're floating hard, you're like hardcore like many, many stitches, you're floating, okay? Like huge areas where like you're just carrying yarn in the back. It's wild. In fact, let me see if I can show you. It's not gonna be as easy to see because of how I did it, but like you can kind of see that there's just there's just a lot happening. So once I realized that and I couldn't get my tension like to settle down, I thought I can't knit this in pieces. It's taking me too long to keep the tension and I, if I knit at this pace to keep the tension nice, I'll never finish. So I was like, okay, let me try something else. I tried ladder back jacquard. That didn't work. I tried a different catch technique. It also didn't work. It actually made it look like more lumpy. And I was like, so then I was just like, all right, we're just going to knit this in the round. And then I started looking at the five patterns or whatever that people... <laughs> That should have told me something because very few people have made this coat, okay? Very few people. So one woman was like, I made a kimono version. And I thought, great, I've never worn a kimono in my life, but how hard could it be? So anyway, <laughs> I calculated some things. Oh, also, hold on. Let me just show you very quickly, like my little attempts at the ladder back to card. Let's see. Boop, boop. 
I did I did like two color changes before I was like absolutely not anyway so here's the problem this will come back when I talk about some of my other things in progress but when you are I think I this is completely like off the top of my head but I've been thinking about this just a little bit when you're knitting things flat you're basically simulating sewing a garment you're getting your pieces right they're just knitted they're not like you're not cutting out a piece of fabric you're knitting a piece of fabric and then you're seaming up the sides and like that will have a seam allowance and it's just, it's like the same thing so when you're trying to determine your size for a sewn project you can do what's called flat measuring which is you lay the, the pattern pieces down and then you measure across excluding the seam allowance to see okay how big is this piece going to be and then if I add it to all the other pieces does it like fit around my chest does it fit around my hips does it right whatever when you're knitting they've kind of done all of that for you to give you the finished circumference and it's like okay that seems to make sense cool this pattern wasn't super size inclusive it was weird and it was in pieces and I was like I don't think this is gonna fit with the right ease that I would need for it to actually be a comfortable wearable coat I can put over other sweaters which is what I wanted so I did a bunch of math which I can't find now I don't know where those like index cards are, but they probably shamed themselves and threw themselves away, okay? But I did a bunch of math and then I was like, great, let's just go for it. So I knit the sleeves, I believe, first. No, that's not true. I was gonna knit the sleeves first. I knit the body first and I kept trying it around and I thought, this is great. This is fitting my hips. I have 53 inch hips at the moment <laughs> um but my waist is like 38 so everything anyway this this pandemic thanks but when you're knitting and sewing you got to take your current accurate measurements whatever they are and mine are a little bit more than I would like which I'm glad I measured because I was going off of three years ago and uh, -uh. so that is quite a difference 53 to 38 it's a 15 inch difference it has always been 15 inch difference for my body just the numbers are different so the proportions are the same but the actual diameter is diameter circumference is different so anyway I started to get worried because I was like well it fits my hip also this is a bottom up sweater okay not top down but bottom up mistakes were made okay so anyway so I got past my hips fit great got to my waist fit kind of janky and y'all already know and for those of you who are new I will tell you I have a very narrow back so I I wouldn't call myself broad-shouldered but people call me broad-shouldered whatever that means like I'm a linebacker which is weird I don't think they seem super wide but they're juicy like I have you know, I'm padded. I'm a padded girly, okay? So like from the front, things generally, I pick the size, it fits fine. Like this fits like a dream. I did alter the back. I forgot to mention that to make it a little bit narrower so that I wasn't gonna have the problem with the test knit, which was like a gaping back. And you see that? It's perfect. Anyway, this is top down. So it was very easy to calculate, okay, here's what my bust measurement is, but my back is narrower. So if I distribute like X number of stitches from the back to the sleeves that will give me enough space in the sleeves for my juicy arms and the back won't be all saggy and crazy looking. But when you are doing bottom up, and this is why people don't like doing bottom up, I hadn't had a problem with it before, but I was a very different shape 15 years ago when I was doing bottom up in the round sweaters, okay? Once I hit my waist, I started to panic because I was like, um, I don't know how to calculate these decreases because the, it's a, it's a pattern. It's do, how, like what, how do I get this to not interrupt the flowers? <laughs> so I was just like, 
huh? And I just kept knitting. I just kept knitting because what else could I do? So I, I knit and I knit and I knit and then I got to the underarms and I like kind of tried it on and was like, this seems really big, like really big. But you know what? The arms aren't on yet. They're going to take up some of this. It was delusion. When I told you that delusion was here, like the, the hoops I jumped through to finish this garment and have it not fit in any way is wild. This was like four months of knitting and a lot of yarn, I mean. So anyway, what ended up happening is that I got to the very top and then I realized that I had to stop the pattern at some point because I had to do some decreases because how was I gonna finish it? So I decided to do this kind of fun striped thing, which I actually liked until I realized this whole thing is like intense color work, so it's heavy. This is no color work at all, it's just, it's just stockinette. And so all of this is hanging off of plain old stockinette instead of color work. And I was just like, this isn't structurally sound. <laughs> and I was like, can I put a seam on the inside? Is there a way that I could add like some kind of, and I was like, oh my, like, what am I doing? And I just was like, you know what? It's too late. I have two weeks or whatever to get finished. I need to just do it and then I need to steek it. And I was super panicked about steeking it, which in the end turned out to be the easiest part of this whole thing. Okay, so that was, I, I learned a thing there. So hooray. But it's just too big. It's too big. It hangs funny. There's like a bunch of ripples in the back that kind of look like intentional, like Jane Austen era floof. But like, I mean, we all know it's a fail. So while I enjoyed knitting this and while I loved it dearly, it does not fit. And that is a lesson to you all. Oh, and that was the other thing. The reason I, I also didn't want to knit it in pieces was because in the pictures, they didn't match. Like they didn't seem like they didn't match the, the pattern. So like there were just half flowers in places. And I was like, that looks terrible. I do not want to knit something that looks like that. But guess what? Once I got to the armholes and started doing my decreases, yep, half flowers. Could have just done it according to the pattern. I'm not like willing to give up on this. Um, I don't think this is salvageable. First of all, I cut it. <laughs> like it's been steeped so I can't like rip it out um what I'm thinking though is I, well a I could um probably like cut some pieces out of it and do something I don't know I haven't it's, I'm so traumatized by it like I haven't really thought too much about like what to do with this but what I was thinking is maybe when I've had a little bit more space because it's been in a bag in, a, in the bottom of like shoved in the back of my bookshelf since October. I just refused. This is the first time I've taken it out and looked at it since I got back from Rhinebeck. So, but what I'm thinking is I'm probably just going to re-knit it. And y'all are probably gasping right now, like what? Remember the snowy forest that I botched twice? And then on the third time I was like, you know what? Which because I've gained a little bit of weight since I knit it, it's it actually is too short. Like it needs to, I need to lengthen it. So part of me was just like, oh no. <laughs> so it doesn't fit anymore, but that's fine. Whatever. Um, <clears throat> I really wanted this coat and I still really want this coat. And part of me is like, if I knit it in pieces and I just follow the directions and I don't try to be smarter than the pattern maker, maybe I will actually end up with something that fits properly that I can wear that is structurally sound just maybe. So I need a little bit of a, I need some time because I want to wear this in the fall. This feels like a fall jacket to me. Um, I was thinking this one could be salvaged by like lining it with silk or something to try to like give it some structure, but it's just too big. So like I might turn it into like a house coat. Um, it's a little scratchy to be honest for a house coat. So I don't know how well that's going to work. Um, but we'll see. We will see. Anyway, so that's that. Those are my finished objects. Um, two wins and a fail feel like great to me. I'm just sad that the fail was a four month fail that also I couldn't wear at Rhinebeck because it was it was hot. It was it was rainy and muddy, and it was warm. So I was like, even if I had done it and it fit, I wouldn't have been able to wear it. 
I did, I did take my Johnny top and I did wear my Johnny top. So some piece of knitting was worn, but mostly I just wore a t-shirt and some sweatpants because it was hot. And I was like, all right, what am I working on now? You might be asking. Well, many things, so many things, but in the spirit of, but what have you touched in the last like two weeks? Not that many. <laughs> so we're not, I'm not gonna, this is, I said this last time, um, I, I say this a lot. I'm not gonna go dig up every project bag in this house. Um, first of all, I don't know where they all are. Second of all, I haven't touched many of them in a long time. So there's, it's pointless. There's no, there's no progress being made. Um, I will try to fix that. I would like to resurrect something every quarter to try to finish it just to like clear out. Cause there's just, a, someday I'll maybe if y'all want do, a tour but it's very small in here so the tour is mostly just chaos um but there's a lot of there's a lot of bags there's a lot of bags so let's just start with what I've been working on of late so two years ago I decided that I would start making myself a birthday shawl and I made the starflake by no not the starflake what did I make hold on I did make a starflake I made a lot of Stephen West's two years ago. I was really, I was doing a lot, but let me see very quickly. <laughs> oh, the Starflake was very pretty though. Hello. The Slip Stravaganza. I made the Slip Stravaganza and I made it using Whole Super Soft. So this year I was on the internet, specifically on IG, and Natasha Hornby, listen, I don't know what she has against me, but the woman can't make a bad pattern. Okay, the Johnny Top is like one of the favorite, my favorite things of, of 2023. And she put out this pattern for this shawl, the R2 shawl, which I'm sure you've heard of because everybody has been making it. Um, I saw it and thought, that's my birthday shawl. Now, I had been hemming and hawing for months of like, what's my birthday shawl going to be? I wanted it to be the mystery knit along, like the the MCAL, Stephen West MCAL, but like that was drama. And I just didn't, I, it, I didn't even do mine because it was too stressful, the whole, that whole situation. So I needed to pick something that wasn't that. I was not sure what I wanted to pick. It was supposed to be another Stephen West but then I saw that picture and was like uh, -uh we're making we're making the R2s <laughs> we're making the R2s so let me show you what the R2s looks like in case y'all don't know what it's what it's supposed to be hold on let me find a good this is a good picture so this is the R2s if you have not seen it it is gorgeous it, it yeah that it's just, she's, she's an amazing, an amazing designer. Um, so I looked through all of my yarn in this whole room, all of it. And I could not find enough colors in a sport weight to make the shawl. And I thought, but my birthday is like in a month. I think I had five weeks. I think I had five weeks. And I thought, you know, I've done crazier things. I could knit a shawl in four weeks. So let me order some yarn and just let's just let's just let's get there <laughs> I couldn't find any sport weight online that wasn't sold out <laughs> and with enough colors so I was like starting to panic because I'm like I need yarn local start stores didn't have enough sport weight like nobody had anything so I was just like okay I'm gonna get holst and I'm gonna hold it double and like maybe this will be my tradition where like my birthday shawl is always made out of holst and that's that like it'll make it easy to like not do this again next year like when it's time for a shawl so because I really did love my slip stravaganza, slip stravaganza I loved it it's a little scratchy but I didn't block it properly and I now have the unicorn wash and hopefully hot water but we'll see but they always have great colors the thing I love about super soft is that the colors work so beautifully together that it's like almost effortless like I had already thought in my mind of a color palette and then was like nobody has these colors so I went to Holst and they did and I thought of course they have the colors that I want because like they're not in America and I have five weeks to knit this <laughs> to knit this shawl so anyway long story short I put in an order um I will show you what the colors are because I have misplaced these yarns that's how long it's been since I picked this up. It's been a couple weeks and I put them somewhere for safekeeping and I can't remember where the safekeeping is, but that's, that's either here nor there. But these are the yarns that I picked. So if you follow me on Instagram, 
you will have seen these in a slightly different configuration looking nicer. Of course, iPad, thank you. Um, but let me just show you what I have so far. Let me show you. So this is whole super soft in the following colors. Princess. Oh, you know what? Let me try to do, well, it's not going to work because I don't have the other colors, but let me try. All right. Here is what I have so far. Ah, it looks so good. Oh my God. Oh my God. This pattern, this is, sorry, it's because it's in progress and like on these needles, it's very hard to, there we go. So this is graphite. Um, the white, actually, let me come down here so that there's some bigger sections. This cream is nougat. The purple is princess, I believe. I've got two purples, so I'm like, hmm, I think this is princess. And then this is old gold. And all of these are just whole super soft. So the texture of the waffle weave was so delightful. I did mess it up a couple of times because I was just like kind of unfocused. Um, but once I focused, it ended up going quite well. So I just, it's just like this part alone is really, like I could imagine a shawl just with like these stripes and it would be amazing. But then you get to this like intense mosaic section and it's just like, oh, it's so pretty. It's so, so, so pretty. So I'm getting ready to transition into the next chart, which is the yellow and the graphite, and then the lighter purple that I showed in the other picture. So I'm going to keep working on this, but I knew I wasn't going to hit my deadline of my birthday because I just had too many things going on. And again, the house has been kicking my butt. So I just was like, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to go with the flow. I'm going to be a little bit less like rigid about timelines. I was knitting it on my birthday and then I was like, I'll finish it by Christmas. That didn't happen either, but I did finish this by Christmas. So I mean, you know, ah, whatever. So we'll get back to that, but it is hard on the hands. The holst doubled. I'm not loving it, which is why it has not progressed as much as other things because it's just not as enjoyable to knit. I don't like it as much, but I know I will like the outcome. So we are going to press on. You're going to press on. Now, upstairs in my little hallway up here, um, it's about 13 feet long. And I have a runner that I was using in my old apartment in the kitchen. And I thought this will be a great thing to put upstairs in the hallway. I laid it out. It isn't long enough. And I was like, huh, I guess this house is slightly bigger than I thought. So it's, you know, whatever. But then I thought, okay, well, let me go online and see if I can find a runner that sort of fits the aesthetic I'm going for that isn't like a thousand dollars and I could not find anything. So in another moment of delusion, I thought, you know, I crochet. I'll just crochet one. So then I was like, okay, um, if I'm going to commit to this, it needs to be like an art deco -y type theme. So something like very like geometric. Um, it also needs to be black and white. It also needs to be washable. And it also needs to be sturdy. So then I was like, okay, uh, that's a lot of, of needs to be like, what yarn am I going to get for this? So I'm like on the internet, like Googling, like, crochet rug yarn like what is and so everyone's like well you could do cotton or you could do wool but wool and I was like I'm not crocheting a wool rug like even superwash like no I was like mm -mm. no I need something else that's sturdier than that wool sturdy but it's not like walking on it every single day with like your feet sturdy um so I settled on a surprising yarn choice but before I tell you what it is let me show you what I have so far let me show you what I have so far. Now I'm showing it to you this way because it's kind of, it's, it'll be, it's challenging, but basically this is the top. So this will be by the stairs and then I'm knitting it this way. So, um, I don't, what is this? Let's see. Three, six. So I've got about nine inches eight to nine inches 
<laughs> I'm not even through the first motif completely. Um, I have to crochet 13 feet. So this is a year long project. <laughs> the good news is that it's very portable. So you just do it's this is mosaic crochet it's overlay mosaic crochet um you just you do one color at a time one row at a time and that's it so I can take this with me I think as it gets bigger it'll be harder um <laughs> so it'll end up being my downstairs chair crocheting or whatever but I just love this it's so pretty now I will link all of the pattern stuff below. And I can't remember this person's name, but um, it's a free pattern. There was supposed to be a chart that came with it and there isn't. So I might have to draft a pattern because, uh, sorry, a chart, because it's really challenging to keep track of where you are with just words. Like the whole pattern is written out in words and it's, it's, it's a struggle. Um, the other thing that's tricky about this is that you might be able to tell that the border is not symmetrical. So like it's symmetrical this way, like the repeats, sorry, this is like here, let me, maybe if I wear it, there we go. So like, these are all the same. You can kind of see they're all the same, but these two aren't the same because you're then switching directions. And so then all of these will be the same. So what's happened is that the side border and the top and bottom border don't match the center motifs. Like the center motif is sort of doing its own thing. And then the border is doing its own thing, but because there's no chart, they're doing their own thing in words. So what I have to do is actually separate the side pattern because I'm going to, so this is supposed to just be two repeats and then a border. It's like a kitchen size rug, even though I think it's kind of small for that. Um, because I'm going for like another 12 feet, um, I'm going to have to repeat this section. And I don't think that this will repeat properly because as you can see, there's like just these like couple of rows where you're transitioning to this. So it's not going to be a clean repeat. So anyway, I have to figure out how to do that. I did start one and it kind of worked okay. Um, I started making a chart, it kind of worked okay, but it's not dark enough. And I think I kind of botched it. So I'm gonna probably do it on the computer. It's easier, I get more squares. It'll be more whatever. But let me just show it to you one more time. Let me just show it to you one more time because I'm getting ready to tell you what yarn I used, okay? So let me give it to you up close so that you can really see it. Okay. Love this project. It's so addictive. In fact, I hurt my arm. I was knitting it so, or uh, crocheting it so fervently. So I had to take a break and implement my, uh, my stretches, you know, where you're like doing this and you're doing, you know, this and whatever. So like I could keep crocheting because I'm like, I die more rows. I just like seeing the, the like design come out while you're doing it is so satisfying so satisfying so i haven't heard anybody use the word pop uh what is it potato chipping any like in the last year but it was like a, a whole thing for a while now i told you all the things that i was trying to accomplish with this yarn choice so uh sturdy washable black and white and i forgot the other thing yeah just close stuff so what did i choose Red Heart, super saver. So I told y'all, I will 100% spend money on some fancy cashmere silk merino blend yarn and turn right around and go to Joanne and get some Red Heart. So this whole runner is gonna cost me like $40 <laughs> because I was able to get jumbo packs. I think I only need three of each. I think we'll see. Um, and that's it. So um, yeah, we're not yarn snobs over here. Okay. I love a nice, fluffy, expensive yarn, but I also like my staples. I love a Karen Simply Soft for acrylic, especially for garments. Um, and I love Red Heart, I'm finding out for like home deck. Did not expect that. Loving the outcome. It gets so many compliments when I go out. Like everyone's like, oh my God, it's so pretty. And I'm like, it's cheap acrylic. It is cheap acrylic and I agree with you. It is amazing. So anyway, those are my two works in progress. Um, I'm also doing a test knit for Alicia Plums. Um, I have not gotten very far 
So I guess I probably shouldn't have said that on camera because like, but this is like my, my curse of my test knitting, right? Like it's just, I gotta stop doing it. I'm really enjoying it though. Um, it's a great community of people doing the test knit and I chose uh, Punk Rock Unicorn for my yarn because it was, I got two kits for the Stephen West mystery knit along and the green one I was using for the MCAL and then this one was like the Sakura, which is like kind of um, mahogany, a like really deep, reddish purple um like a peony color and then like a light pink so they're really pretty it's really pretty so i think it's going to be really great and it's a lot of garter stitch which i'm enjoying um just timing just just timing still doing house stuff and it's winter in wisconsin which makes things very challenging we got like many feet of snow it's still all out there we're getting more they're, they can't clean the roads it's it's a mess out here it is a mess um but now it's a good time to sit down and hunker and hunker. So those are my knitting and crocheting works in progress. But I've also got some sewing and some quilting. I know, have not done a lot of sewing and quilting on this channel, but you know, you do what the what the heart wants. So I, sorry, saw that rose from crochet. No, not rose. Crochet ADHD. Yes, <laughs> I always get their names confused because they're very similar. But anyway, um, she is doing a hip to be square mal. And I saw the word mal and I thought, oh, wait, that sounds like a quilt because. So I was really excited. So the, the whole concept behind it is you make two blocks, two squares of any type, knitting, crocheting, quilting. Uh, I don't know what else you can make squares out of macram can you macrame a square i don't know whatever whatever you can do craft wise if it's a square it counts so i thought i've been wanting to get back into quilting i have not had the inspiration to do so i've been wanting to and i've been dragging my feet because i haven't had a lot of space and there's been a lot of life stuff and like whatever but i was like i miss quilting and this feels like the perfect time to get back into it perfect excuse so I've had some fabric kicking around my fabric stash, which we're also gonna try to, to do that from stash too. So instead of going out and buying a bunch of new fabric, I used what I had and I supplemented. Look at that, look at me living my values this year. Anyway, I had all this really graphic black and white fabric that I was very excited about. Um, and I couldn't remember what quilt I was gonna make because that was several years ago in a different life. <laughs> and I thought, I'm gonna repurpose this fabric and make it into something joyous and whimsical for this mal. That is the goal, is to not think of sad, bad things when I look at this fabric, because it's such great fabric, but something fun and me and just like uplifting. So I went on the internet, I googled black and white quilts, um, a bunch of really random stuff came up that I was like, I don't have enough fabric to do that, or I don't have the right kind of fabric to do that, and I don't want to buy fabric. So I just kept looking, and I found the chicken block. Now, I don't have the name of this either. So all of this, y'all know, I'm already not great remembering things, and it's been forever. So I'm rusty, and I'm not great at remembering things. But it'll be in the description. Um... But I found this block and then I found a woman who made a whole quilt out of the block and I loved it so much. And I was like, this is my quilt. This is my quilt. So I got up one morning, I ironed all of my fabric, folded it all up, put it into nice little bundles. And then I took it with me to my quilt store, which is on the all the way on the other side of town where I used to live. And I said, help me find some comb fabric so the comb is like the little floofy part of their hair um and beaks and some background that's all I need I've got the chicken bodies I've got fabric but this is what I want and we found some amazing fabric amazing fabric so let me show you my two first blocks so this is block number one so I'm using the Moda Grunge Dots. I don't know what the real name of it is, but that's what I would call it. And if you go to your quilt store, they will know exactly what this is for my background. It's white, so from a distance, 
it's kind of like, it's just like texture, right? Then you get up close and it's like really fun. So there's like kind of some like yellowing, like the grunge is like my favorite, y'all know. I love grunge and knitting, especially like little black speckles or like yellow or blue, like unexpected. So like grunge is one of my favorites for background fabrics um, and also backing fabrics. Like I have another quilt that I use grunge for the back and it's it's like one of my favorite quilts. So this is block number one. I love his little, his little Elvis. I haven't quite figured out yet what kind of, um, what is it called? Not embroidery. I can't think of the word, but when you attach the, the fabric on top, it'll come to me, but it won't probably come to me right now. Anyway, I haven't figured out what technique I want to use for that yet. If I want to do like a running stitch or if I want to do like an applique. See, look at that. Or if I want to do like a proper applique, but I don't really have to worry about that now because I have plenty of time. I have a lot of blocks to make, but that's loose just so that you can see. And then I will stitch that down and then it'll fray to also give the little hair a little bit of texture, which I'm really excited about. So that's block number one. And then I have block number two. And this chicken also has a very silly little, little floofy haircut. So what I was thinking of doing is sort of like finding hairstyles throughout history and trying to give like each chicken as unique of a little hairstyle as possible. So these are all like freehand. I just sort of draw something on my little square, cut it out, and then I like attach it. So that is chicken number two. Now these both have the same fabric body, but I have like a bunch of different fabrics. So y'all will be seeing more chicken blocks as we go on. Um, I have to measure how many I need for a queen size quilt with like a little bit of a hang. Um, so initially, I think we thought I needed 60, but that was just for the inside. I forgot that I needed to add the sashing. Um, so I did that. But yeah, that's my that's my little chicken, my little start to my chicken quilt. And I love it. It's so silly. And it's very me. <laughs> so there's that. Now, I'm also so this, I guess, is the part of the podcast where I talk about my philosophy for 2024. So I'm just going to say, I'm not going to show you all the stuff I bought. I'll do that in a separate podcast. Um, maybe, yeah, that'll just be like a separate episode because I just don't want to spend like another hour like going through like, and then I bought this and then I bought this and then I bought this because it kind of goes against what I'm getting ready to talk about, which is my 2024 philosophy, which is do less, do less in all areas of my life, just do less. So I've been thinking a lot, which I'm sure some of you have as well, about how dissatisfied I am with fashion. And I don't mean fashion like the industry, but like the options of showing my personal style with clothing I can buy in a store. It has been years since I have been truly excited by a garment that I have purchased at a store. Every now and again, I found a, find a piece here or there, but in general, my everyday clothing doesn't fit me that great, is not usually in a fabric that I'm excited about, and is certainly almost never in a color that I'm excited about. So years ago, when I first moved to New York, I was so excited to be in Brooklyn and to have access on my lunch breaks, because I worked in Manhattan, to Mood. And I would go to Mood and just browse their fabrics and just like pick up stuff. And like when I wasn't finding something at Mood, there were like dozens of other fabric stores just like around the corner. And so you could just stumble into any store and say, hey, I'm looking for like a lightweight neoprene. Do you have anything? And then they would lead you to what they had and you buy it and there it is. So it was a really nice experience to be able to make things that I couldn't find anywhere else. Like I just, I really liked that. And then I just sort of got overwhelmed by New York and that's why I don't live there anymore. Um, I got overwhelmed by New York and then the pandemic happened and it just felt very oppressive. And I was like, I can't stay here, I need to leave. So what's challenging now is that I'm in a different market, which I think probably, no, it definitely has less, less, it has a lot more yarn shops, it feels like, than New York, but it has a lot less apparel clothing stores or apparel fabric stores, I should say, than New York. So like, it's a little tricky to find fabric, but that's okay. Um, what I've been thinking about is how hard it is to go shopping here. I don't find a lot of like ready to wear stores that cater to my body size or shape. And so I felt very frumpy here. <laughs> 
Um, I don't know. I mean, is that something to admit? Like, whatever. I felt very frumpy. Like, I don't think of myself as a frumpy person. And I feel like most of my life I've had a very specific style and people have been very complimentary of that style. Um, but I've just felt very like frumpy and invisible here. And I'm like, but that's because I'm wearing stuff that like I'm not happy with. So part of the do less will involve doing more <laughs> up front, but in service of just being less of a consumer. So I would like, I'm going to put this out here on the internet so that y'all can hold me accountable, but I would like to, in the next couple of years, have an entirely handmade wardrobe. I tried this once before. I got very close, minus undergarments, because I just could not figure out how to make anything that fit properly, but I had a bunch of dresses, shirts, and sweaters that I knit, of course, and socks and what you know like lots of knitwear and then I had these dresses and these shirts and they were great but I was also a teacher at the time and so wearing these like fitted 1950s dresses and heels is just like not where I'm at anymore and I can't fit them anymore right so I could probably tweak the pattern make those dresses again but it's just kind of not quite me at this moment what I would like is good fitting jeans that are high waisted that cover my whole butt because that's very challenging but also aren't gaping at the waist. I would like a nice pair of fitted pants that again fit well that are in a good nice solid fabric. Um, I would like some interesting woven tops that have visual interest in colors and fabrics that I don't generally see um, and I would like to make my own underwear and bras. That is what I would like to do. So what I've decided is to start small with one pattern. So one way that you can sort of expand a handmade wardrobe is to, especially a sewn one. Knitting, I think, is a little bit different Like and crocheting. Like you can tweak the fit based on the style sort of anytime you're making things. If you have a lot of alterations to do in a sewing pattern, however, making a bunch of different patterns is very overwhelming. And that is why I stopped sewing because I have, as I mentioned earlier, when I was talking about the coat and like all the things that went wrong with the coat, my proportions are very extreme. And as a result, nothing out of the package is even close to fitting. Now, almost nobody is going to be able to take a sewing pattern and like make a muslin and it just kind of fits them. Like that's pretty rare. Everybody tends to need to do some kind of adjustment. But when you're looking at adjustments and they're like, the typical adjustment for this is like a half an inch and you're like, I'm five inches off. It's just, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work and I don't mind doing it, but I can't pick up a different pattern every week because that's too much mental energy. So again, the do less. How do I come back to my love of sewing, but do less? pick one pattern. <laughs> so I'm going to perfect this one pattern. I went through all of my patterns and I thought, okay, which of these patterns gives me the most bang for my buck in terms of alterations? And I found the Solar Tee by Paper Cut Patterns. So this is what it looks like. So this is it. Try to hold it a little bit closer. So it is a semi-boxy shaped sweater or shirt or shirt which is very exciting so what that means is i can either use a knit fabric or a woven fabric so the, oh, right there there's two options sweatshirty type vibe or structured shirt, shirt vibe it's short sleeve or long sleeve so again summer version fall version you can add the ruffle you can leave the ruffle off so that is six different options for one pattern so what i'm thinking is if i can get the fit on this shirt perfect i can then create a master copy and then as i find fun fabrics i can just make versions of this shirt and that's what i'm going to do so i don't know that i'm going to make a long sleeve woven version that feels like it might be a little bit restrictive and i don't know about fitting lower arms i don't think i've done that before so mm. but short sleeve version 100 percent, ruffled 100 percent um knitted with long sleeves definitely that seems like a super cute like sweatshirt type vibe 
especially with the ruffle, but without the ruffle, very basic, simple thing that will fit well, that will match a lot of my outfits. So that's kind of like where I'm at right now. Like, can I take a pattern that has a lot of options, get it to fit my body, and then just make a bunch of those. And that's like step number one to like this me made wardrobe that is like 100% created by me. Um, the challenges that I'm going to face with this are that because of my proportions, the alterations that I have to make often conflict. So I've never, I've never made a successful, well-fitting pair of pants because of that. Um, so we're just starting small, starting with a shirt. My plan is the front, I've put the front, I've, I've made a muslin, so it's going to not look like a whole lot, <laughs> but this is my muslin. It looks gigantic like flat, which is always so funny to me, like how large things you make look versus things you buy in the shops. Like, so interesting. So anyway, I put this on the other day and I was so pleased because I had already had to alter the hip. So the largest size of this pattern, it is not size, size inclusive, this pattern. They did come out with a plus size version though. So if you need a plus size version, look for that. Do not buy this one. Um, I think they call it curvy maybe or something. Um, so you can get this, just not this particular version. You have to get the plus size version. Didn't exist when I bought this. So there we are. Um, but it doesn't have a big enough hip. So I had to grade five inches out. The biggest size I think was 48. I'm 53. So I was like, with ease, if I add two and a half inches to the front and the back, so one and a quarter inches to each side seam, that will give me enough space in the hips. And it was perfect. Fits perfectly from the front. I turned around. And this little narrow back of mine was doing the most, okay? It fits horribly from the back. The whole back looks like I took a bunch of like bedding and just like bunched it up and like shoved it in there. So it's like super baggy between my shoulder blades. It's super baggy from like shoulder blade to shoulder blade and then under. The whole waist looks like it needs to be scooped out because like I have a large posterior and a smaller waist. Um, it's also riding above my butt. So like, there's not enough fabric to like hang properly. So like, I have so many alterations to do to get this to fit. But I'm also just like, this is the step towards a, an easier future, an easier future where I just cut out the pattern, sew it up and I have a shirt. So that's what we're going to do is we're going to move slower this year. We're going to try to really focus on detailing and fit this year um because I had several fails even knitting fails last year where the fit just wasn't right because I wasn't respecting the contours of my body I was just either hoping for the best or I was just like going by somebody else's like definition of fit so that's what we're gonna do and I'm really excited about it um if you have suggestions for um bra patterns I definitely remember there was um I think it was like called like the Copley bra by orange orange lingerie maybe so I will take a look at them I've heard really good things about them but I'm really terrified to make a bra especially because I don't live in New York anymore and finding those like lingerie fabrics is a real struggle like power mesh and all these different things like it's a lot <laughs> so I'm like I'm gonna have to buy all that stuff on the internet and that seems very daunting so I at least better start with a good pattern but I'm not in a rush to start working on that yet that feels like a maybe next winter thing um, I really want to get the shirt down and then also I bought the pattern for these shorts now again the curvy came out after. I think there's a curvy version for the shorts. I'm not entirely sure, but these aren't going to fit my legs like at all. 53 inch hips. Each thigh is 32 to 33 inches. It's not going to fit. So I'm going to have to do some, some maneuvering to get, to get these to fit, but that's okay. Um, the point is to use the patterns as like a jumping off point And again, to adapt to your body. Um, for those of you who have a lot of fit challenges, it can be very tedious, but those fit challenges, I think I, I watched a video and they were talking about this in that video, which was like, you're going to have the same fit challenges when you put on a pair of pants at the mall too, or I guess our malls do the, they still exist like at a store, right? Like 
they're cutting clothing very similar to these proportions which is why when you go into a store and put them on they don't look good so it's like either they cannot look good and you've spent all this money and time trying them on at a store or they cannot look good and you're in your house and you can tweak them until they do look good option number two seems better to me and is also again less work <laughs> in the long run in the short term it's it's definitely more work and it's very tedious but I don't know when I put the top on and I saw the front fit like really well, I was really happy. And I was like, yes, this is why I sew things. So there will be more sewing adventures, but I'm taking it slow. I'm not going to be stressed. And hopefully at the end of it, I will have an amazing garment. Um, just a tip for folks who are maybe getting into garment sewing, um, invest in the cheapest fabric you can get at like a Joann's. So I bought a bolt of like quilting cotton because it's a woven and it's not super stiff. It's also not super lightweight, like gauzy. You don't want something like that. You want something kind of like in the middle. Um, and you can get really good deals because Joann's is always having these like giant sales. So I have 10 yards of fabric to play with to like perfect these two patterns. And I might need more, but it's again, it'll be relatively cheap. I will say that there is a waste element to doing this that will probably be upsetting to some people but I like to think of it as you're wasting now to not waste later because how many pieces of clothing do you have in your closet that you're never going to wear because they don't fit well so that's just kind of how I'm looking at it but I am thinking a lot about that I've been watching a lot of things about fast fashion and Shein and Timu and it's like very upsetting and I'm like ah like I'd already thought about this like handmade wardrobe before that, but like even now after all that, I was just like, oh wow, I just really would like to to not be part of all of that. I would like to have things that are sustainable, that are gonna last, that are gonna fit, that are gonna be my personal style. Um, and imagine like how great I will feel when I go out wearing an outfit that I've made that like fits me really well, you know? So anyway, like this sweater. I am always a problem when I'm out in this sweater. So that's what we're going for. <laughs> anyway, so that's my philosophy for this year. Um, I'm going to try to buy less yarn. I'm going to try to crank out less garments, less items, and really just focus on the fit and the finish of my items and really just like hone in on those things. Um, and yeah, I hope you all come along on the journey with me. Now, um... I want to talk a little bit about things that are bringing me joy. I know no acquisitions, but another time. Um, what are the things bringing me joy? Tennis. <laughs> now you might be like, tennis, it's winter. It is, well, in the Northern hemisphere. Yes, it is. Yes, it is winter. I've been doing indoor tennis lessons and tennis practice with my friend, one of my volleyball friends from the summer. I used to play tennis in high school and I was good, but not like actually good, right? Like I was bigger and stronger than the other girls for my age. And so I was good, but I didn't learn good stroke mechanics. I didn't learn a good serve. I can't volley. I have a like, terrible mobility on the court, um, which all got like realized when I became an adult and started playing other people. And I was like, oh, I can hit some heavy shots but otherwise I'm not very good. <laughs> so last summer I was really upset. Um, I broke up with my partner and one of the things that we would do would be to go to the high school over here and play tennis. And there is a meetup that meets over there and they play tennis like multiple times a week, but I was always the weak link, like always. Like I would go and I would watch them and they'd be playing doubles and I'm like, I can't volley and I also can't really serve. And like, everything is like really inconsistent. I'm like spraying balls. And like, sometimes I hit a great shot and then sometimes I hit the ball like in the parking lot, like not good. People didn't really want to play with me. <laughs> like they weren't rude because it's Wisconsin. Um, but they were just sort of like, Oh, Hey. And I was like, yeah, the, Oh, Hey is like a, Oh no, it's she's back. And we have to be nice to her and let her play with us. But like, we were getting into a rhythm and yikes. <laughs> Like, that's what the oh, hey, for those of you who don't speak Midwest. Um, so anyway, long story short, I was like, if I take lessons over winter. So last year I did I did ice skating. This year I wanted to do ice skating and ballet, but I just 
I just ended up picking tennis because I was like, I really want to, I was enjoying my tennis playing and pickleball. I learned how to play pickleball last uh, fall. Um, but I was like, if I get consistent at tennis, I could actually have a whole built in network of tennis players, like three blocks from my house. So I was like, that feels like a bigger priority than like, like baby deering it across the ice. <laughs> so I've been doing tennis and it has been, I've had two lessons so far. And in those two lessons, the teacher has fixed mechanics that I have never even thought about. And I'm already better. So I'm already better. I'm already more consistent. I'm already not hitting things wildly. Um, so I'm really, I'm really excited. I signed up for another course with her called biomechanics to like really like dive into like the mechanics of a forehand, a volley, a backhand, a serve. Um, so I'm just like excited. I'm excited to like become a more, I guess, consistent, consistent. Like even if I'm not like an amazing player, I just want to be able to hit the ball back in the court consistently. That is what I would like. I don't need to be like a top power player or anything like that. I just want to not be spraying balls all over the court and actually hit them where I would like them to go. That's it. So if I can get that out of these lessons, then it's a win. And I think I'm already getting that out of these lessons. So that is a big source of joy and happiness for me. Um, the other thing that's bringing me joy is I started back learning languages. So without getting into too much detail, I stopped doing a lot of my language studying because of a bad relationship. And it's taken me a while to sort of remember the things I used to really enjoy. And one of those things is learning languages. So I've been doing a little bit of Korean every day, the whole time because Duolingo and the streak and all of that. But a couple of weeks ago, I thought, I want to be more intentional about Irish and Spanish. Because I really enjoy learning them. Like, it's just really fun to learn a language that you don't really know from the beginning. Um, French is at this point basically like a fluency level for me. Um, it goes and comes in terms of whether I can speak it fluently, but I can understand it fluently most of the time and I can read it and all of that. So that's a separate skill. Korean is like an intermediate where like I'm not really getting better, but I'm not getting worse. Um, so I would say I'm like kind of like a low intermediate. Okay, I'm back. I think I ran out of storage, but somehow it's still working. So I don't know what happened anyway. But like through osmosis, I've basically like acquired a bunch of Spanish. So that's fun, but I don't know grammar and I don't really know vocab. So I want to work on that. And then Irish is just fun. I did it when I was in seventh grade with a friend. We learned some like silly phrases. I went to Ireland. I was able to speak to a couple of people at a bar and say really silly things and they were tickled by it. And I just find it fun. I love like the beginning stages of learning a language before all the grammar and like all the listening and the speaking and everything gets in the way. Um, so yeah, so those are the two things that sorry, the two languages that I'm going to focus on. Korean will still be there. French will still be there. But I'm just like really excited to like dive into getting better at Irish and Spanish. So if you speak either of those languages, let me know, provide resources, um, especially like shows to watch or books to read or newspapers to, to pick up. Would love to hear about that. Um, and then what is the last thing that is bringing me joy? This is going to sound really silly but my snowblower. <laughs> now, it has snowed a lot here in the past couple of weeks. And in the summer, when I bought the house, I thought, oh, wait, I'm a homeowner now. I'm going to have to like get rid of the snow some kind of way. I should get a snowblower. And I bought one and then everybody in my neighborhood was telling me about how we have a snowblower fairy or snow fairy, whatever they call him. Um, but his snowblower wasn't working this season. And so he wasn't able to do it. So I was so grateful because I almost was like, well, what's the point of even having one if somebody just sort of does all of our sidewalks, right? I used it for the first time after one of our big snows. Never pushed one before, never mowed a lawn before, didn't know how to do anything. And it was so exciting. I'm not saying that I'm going to snow blow the whole neighborhood because I'm not, that's, it, it was still quite a bit of work, but it was just kind of fun to see it like kind of like plowing through all the snow and like shooting it everywhere. Like, I don't know. It's, it's a silly thing, but it's like when you have to deal with adversity and the weather for the last like 10 days has been very adverse, you have to find like your little moments of, of, uh, you know, 
uh, serendipity where you can. And so for me, it was finally figuring out how to put together my snowblower, charge the batteries. They were so cold that they wouldn't charge. So I had to bring them inside and like warm them up um, and then actually use it. So anyway, um, I hope that you enjoyed this episode and um, I hope that <laughs> it will not be another six months before I record another video. Um, if you enjoyed this video, please like it and subscribe so that you are aware of when the next one is coming out. But like I said, I'm gonna try to get back to once a month with the occasional like mid month situation. And I still gotta tell you guys about all the stuff I bought at Rhinebeck and Woolen Folk and Wisconsin Sheep and Wool. So that's a lot, that's three festivals worth of stuff that I've purchased, not to mention just like other things going on in the local community here. Um, so I'll probably be, probably be back in two weeks to tell you about those things because I mean, Rhinebeck was like five months ago, but um, I don't know. I feel like it's kind of fun to, to talk about those things, even if it's like well after the fact. So just a reminder, if you knit something for the Miss the Boat Cal, you knit a ranunculus, please tag me on Instagram or email me at theblacksheepknitter at gmail.com and I will pick winners. And in my next video, I will announce those winners. So thank you very much for watching and happy knitting. Bye.